So it looks like we're streaming, ready to go? In about two, three seconds. Okay. We're, we're ready to go. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call to order the June 7th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting and going to do roll call. Uh, Commissioner Heising? Present. Commissioner Maggio? Present. Looks like Vice Radnich. Present. And it would appear that three of our commissioners are excused. Well, first, I should say uh, Chair Farzan is present. And then Commissioner Strom, Labange, and Mason are excused for tonight's meeting. And moving on to item number three, do we have any public comments for things not on tonight's agenda? Anyone in attendance is welcome to use the raise hand button at the bottom of their screen or star nine if you are calling in. And these are for public comments that are for items within the purview of the Planning Commission, but not on the agenda. Seeing none. Great. Thank you. Uh, we don't have anything on the consent calendar and we do not have any continued public hearings. So I'm gonna go ahead and call a new public hearings. Um, 6A on the agenda, TR 9539, TR 23-19 and TD 50-19. Um, Samuel Bing and Linda Lay Lee, owners for Z1 zoning. And I believe Jonathan is going to provide the staff report. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, today's item is track 9539 and design review application 23-19. The project takes place at the end of Stewart Street, which is a small public road between Mount Diablo Boulevard and Highway 24. Highway 24 is to the north. There's a preschool and commercial spaces to the west, multifamily housing to the south, multifamily housing to the east, and that parcel to the east was approved in 2019 uh, for redevelopment for a 42 apartment uh, unit project, and the property owner is Freethy. This project, um, DR2319, has been reviewed twice before by the Design Review Commission at study sessions and an additional two times as part of a formal application review um, in uh, 2019, twice, excuse me, twice in 2021. So the scope of work includes uh, the construction of 12 condominium units on a vacant parcel on Stewart Street. These 12 for sale units are housed within three detached buildings. You'll see they're labeled West, Middle, and East. So West, they have five units, Middle, four, and the East units have three. Of the 12 units, two of those units are below market rate, also for sale. You'll see that the West units are accessed by a private drive, um, each coming off of Stewart Street, and then the Middle and East units are accessed by two private drives coming off of this private street. The permit requests for this application include a major subdivision, which is required to record the condominium map so that each unit can be sold individually and have unique ownership. There's also a design review for new buildings in the downtown, a category two tree permit for the removal of the existing trees on the property to accommodate the development and then also waiver requests in line with California state density bonus law, which say which allow developers waivers to development standards if they meet certain for affordability requirements. Um, again, two units being provided um, below market rate. So a bit more on project history. This is a SNP from the plans presented at the November 13th, 2018 um, study session with the Design Review Commission. And you can see that the design concept and the site layout has largely been unchanged since that first meeting. You have 12 units housed within three individual buildings, um, stepping with the hillside as, you, as the site slopes to the east. Units coming off of Stewart Street, middle and east units coming off of a private street here. Um, in this first meeting, you'll notice um, that because it's a study session, the architectural detailing um, is not quite as substantial as it got to today. And that's just the nature of a study session. 
They then, they then met again with the Design Review Commission for a second study session in June 24, 2019. And this is when you start to see uh, the appearance of the building resembling what is being proposed today. So the, the applicant responded to the commission's comments to use a, a wider variety of colors and materials, which is the same color scheme that's proposed today. You start seeing the massing techniques, the pop-outs, the, the balconies, the penthouses on the roof line. Um, but again, design concept um, staying the same. 12 units, three individual buildings. As we move to the current proposal, again, um, not a quite a bit of change from the design of those study sessions. But you see uh, the one change is the project starts to follow the slope of the land as it rises um, in slope as you get to um, Highway 24 at the north side. There are a couple of, of documents that uh, guide development um, in the city that pertain to this project. One is the general plan, which identifies this project in the East End commercial land use designation and allows a maximum density of 35 dwelling units per acre. Then there is also the more recent downtown specific plan adopted in 2012, which identifies this property in the East End district of downtown and which allows housing by right. The project is in the general commercial one district or C1 district, and the project complies with the district standards for land use. Again, multifamily housing allowed by right. The parking requirement, building height, and the number of stories. The project does not comply with um, setbacks and the location of guest parking. But again, instead of requesting a variance or exception, they're requesting um, waivers through California state density bonus law which we will look at now. So those waivers, those are included in the staff report and I'll briefly go over those now. So in the C1 zoning district, the front yard setback is required to be 10 feet. They're proposing development at five feet, one inch. The side yard, side yard along the private street is required to be 10 feet. They're proposing at that five feet, five inches. The rear yard setback also requires 10. They're proposing seven feet, one inch. And then also the last bit of the last waiver request is the location of uh, guest parking, which is typically not allowed within that setback. As for review process, SB 330 um, allows for a maximum of five meetings for a city, a local jurisdiction to take final action on a project. Um, Two meetings have occurred already, twice with the Design Review Commission. Those two study sessions that I mentioned previously do not count towards that total. So two meetings have been taken so far. This is the th third meeting of a maximum of five meetings. So based on staff's recommendation of adopting the approval resolution on June 21st, that would be the fourth meeting, allowing a potential fifth meeting if an, a concerned party were to appeal to the City Council. Design Review Commission um, reviewed the project twice in March and April and forward comments to the Planning Commission. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, um, but the Planning Commission is to take final action because it's a major subdivision, it's a new building in the downtown, and there are waiver requests that are, required, that are tiered to be reviewed by the Planning Commission. Uh, Design Review Commission met in March and April they forward comments without a recommendation to the Planning Commission, um, citing concerns with the limited amount of planting and the lack of community space um, beyond the decks that are provided at the roof. They also cited concerns with the potential um, noise mitigations that would be placed to make those decks more usable. And just to speak a bit more on noise, those, those mitigation measures that the applicant's acoustical engineer has discussed. Those are to ensure that the project um, has usable open space and those are not mitigation measures as it pertains to CEQA because CEQA looks at the effects of the project on the environment, not the other way around. So because those noise measurements have not been taken, we did not yet know the extent of those potential sound barriers. So that's part of the direction that's in the staff report tonight. The last bit of concern that the Design Review Commission had 
that you can read more in detail in the minutes is um, the appearance of the east elevations of those buildings. And the commission had concern that the middle and eastern units would be looking at the backside of the units in front of them. And that would not be appealing because of the lack of articulation. So the staff report goes over a few um, recommended uh, directions for the applicant. One is to provide renderings of the east elevation with the proposed green wall and trellises to help address the commission's concerns with the lack of articulation. Next is to submit turning radii exhibits demonstrating the maneuverability of larger vehicles. That is to address comments from the public works. To provide exhibits on the expected sound barrier design, including the potential height of those sound barriers to respond to referral comments from the fire district regarding aerial access. And finally, to provide a calculation for the number of replacement trees resulting from the tree removal. So staff's recommendation is to review the proposal, continue the matter to June 21st to allow the applicant to address those comments and any comments that the commission has and for staff to prepare a resolution approving the project subject to conditions. Here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> Do we have any questions for staff? Jonathan specifically? Uh, yes. It looks like Commissioner Maggio. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, first of all, um, going down to the site and viewing those the poles, what is that current setback from the pole to the street right now that we're looking at? Is that 10 feet? Is that the, or is that the reduced setback that, that's being requested? That should be the requested setback. The, so where, what is where the shown poles on the plans. and the flags are, what they're currently requesting. Yes. Okay. And then secondly, what is the setback for that property just on the other side of that service road? Do they have the 10 foot setback? It looks like at least 10 feet of landscape in front of the project just next door. And, I and, and am while, doing while you're looking at that, there's a new condo project going in on Brown Street and Mount Diablo. And it looks like the setback facing Mount Diablo is very minimal. And I'm curious what that setback is from the street. Uh, doing a rough measurement on the city's JS, it looks like the setback of the southern development to the edge of pavement pavement is about 15 feet. Okay, yeah, that, that seems about right. And then on the new project on Brown and Mount Diablo, um, the condo project looks fairly minimum. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for that and see what I can find. Okay, and great. that being kind of on the main boulevard. Yes. I think there was direction. Yeah. On Bra the, Brown and Mount Diablo corner. Correct. So I think it, there was more of a direction to hold the street um, and not have a significant landscape setback. Right. Um, it's also very narrow, uh, right. so I'll see what I can find. So what I, where I'm going here is being consistent with the rest of the block where you're developing. <laughs> Thanks, that's, that's it. Thank you, do we have any other questions for staff? Commissioner Heising? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Thanks, Jonathan. Um, my question is uh, <clears throat> regarding the project to the east. I remember when that project came to the commission, there was discussion about <clears throat> pedestrian connectivity down to Stewart Street from that project. And um, so a couple questions. Why is the, it looks like there's sidewalk on the south side of the, um, the private drive but not the north, unless I'm reading these, uh, this plan right. sheet wrong. And, um, and then also it transitions before the end of the property line. So my, my, my questions are around uh, uh, pedestrian connectivity down to Stewart and do we have a gap there or is it not continued at all? So that's one question. And then um, <clears throat> it looks like I'm trying to determine the um, the property limits. It looks like it goes 
the property line goes to the middle of that private drive. So is it is it kind of a combination of a flag lot plus uh, these these two lots go to the middle of the drive? I'm trying to figure out ownership of of that private lane, or if it's a flag lot with an easement on the subject parcels. The parcel to the east, um, I think that is the free fee property. That would I'd consider that one more at 1044 Stewart Street. That one would be a flag lot, and the two subject properties. Um, one has direct. Um, one has access to Stewart Street and connection to a private easement, and then the other parcel um, has just um, direct access access from the private easement. So I, I wouldn't consider either of them of a parcel lot. It's more of, sorry, of a flag lot. Um, it's more of a, just a, a private easement. Okay. So back to the pedestrian access is the free fee parcel. I, I can't recall those plans, but I remember we talked about sidewalk connection down to Stewart. Is there a sidewalk? Um, proposed for that project going all the way to the west property line? And will it be a sidewalk going to nowhere is, is what I'm trying to get at. If, if this project doesn't have a sidewalk going to its east property line. I will see what I can find on the free fee project with respect to that sidewalk, that question. And then um, with respect to Commissioner Maggio's question about the setback for the mill at Brown Avenue, uh, it's a minimum of three and a half feet and five feet to the building wall as it undulates back and forth. Uh, this is to the south, the Matteo Boulevard side, and then about 15 feet from face of the building to the curb line. So first measurement was to property line, next measurement is to curb line. And to just a portion of Commissioner Heising's question, um, the applicant does not show a proposed pedestrian walkway on the Samantha Townhomes project, but from comments from Public Works, um, engineering department is willing to accept a, uh, a striping. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that in the in the in the comments. So uh, that that'll get the striping that on the on the private drive will will be that connectivity. Okay, and then there were a couple other comments from engineering. One was um, having handicap ramps on the cur um, curb cuts on the on the corners. And I don't see that on, on these plans. And then also there were, um, there was a request for turning radii calcs. Um, and I see that in staff recommendation. So I'm assuming those were not um, provided. Those were not provided, no. Okay. And as far as the ADA uh, ramps, um, yeah, yes, they're not shown on the plans, um, but the applicant hasn't indicated that they have an issue providing that in the future. They do not have an issue. Okay. They do not. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Radnich. Just to follow up on the garbage truck turnaround, um, the public works comment is regarding Stewart Street. So what is the plan for trash collection for like units six through 12? Is everyone pulling it out to the private street? And is the garbage truck stopping along there? Um, is there any information on that? In my conversations with the applicant, I believe that they will be, each of the middle units and the Eastern units will be pushing those uh, garbage cans out to the edge of the private access easement. Um, but hopefully the applicant will be able to confirm that. Okay. So it's, it's my understanding is that garbage trucks would not be entering the private driveways. On the, but they on the would be going street. on the private street um, off of Stewart Street. Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. Thanks. Do you have any other questions for Jonathan? All right, um, we'll open it up to the applicant. J. 
Jonathan, the first individual to bring in would be Mr. Fry or Mr. Rickard? Um, Mr. Rickard will be introducing Clay Fry. Mr. Rickard, you're in the meeting. Go ahead and turn on your camera and your microphone and you have up to 10 minutes to present. Hi everybody, Stuart Rickard here. My camera, I, my internet is not strong and Clay's gonna lead the presentation anyway. So I just wanted to introduce Clay, who's our architect and just let you know, we're very happy to be uh, bring this project forward, forward to you. Um, as it's a somewhat unique, uh, smaller unit project within um, Lafayette. So thank you and please turn over to Clay. Thank you. Mr. Fry. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for your time, Jonathan. Thank you for uh, your guidance to this point and thank you for a great staff report. Um, I'm happy to share my screen and sort of walk you through why we are where we are and spend my 10 minutes um, that way. Um, I assume you're viewing the screen. As uh, Jonathan mentioned, 12 in full for sale townhomes, mix of ones and twos, 15% affordable. Um, we started designing this project in December of 2017 with staff. And as Jonathan pointed out, the designs evolved a bit. We did study alternative site layouts and had those peer reviewed. Running, utilizing the current private driveway, it's technically not a private street by city maps. It's a easement to the back lots and both parties share access. Um, the sidewalk and the access across the face was studied how to stagger these buildings for the stepped. Um, you already know where it is, so I don't need to share that. But we do step the facades back. So if you look at the five foot line, you know, the setback is much greater in many spots and it does create sort of a sawtooth edge to create um, the articulation. We do have the private drives. This diagram is slightly different than Jonathan's in that we have been in conversations with Kimberly Lamb, the trash consultant who we use to analyze 100 Lafayette Circle with you all. And we have uh, been in discussions with the fire department several times about the best way to pull fire hoses and obtain rooftop access. We have a consultant um, that's meeting with the fire department and submitted discussions about how to park the fire trucks here, here, and here to pull hoses and gain access to the roof. Um, the site does step up the hill. The next floor up is the living floor with the living rooms. We purposely analyzed the site as you do step up that we wanted semi-private spaces facing public spaces. So you didn't have bedrooms looking at bedrooms and living rooms looking at living rooms. Um, having designed a, quite a bit of uh, multifamily, we wanted these to live more like houses where all the public spaces faced west and the private spaces faced east. And then you have a difference in window fenestration. You'll see that in a moment. The next floor up, as you can see, the bedrooms face west and stairwells and bathrooms face east. We tried to create, you know, bedrooms on the corners and living rooms on the corners to get those bay windows. Um, you know, there is quite a dramatic grade change across this site. And so you get almost a full floor jump between each module. So the roof decks actually have sunset views over the top of the units below. Um, the upper floor bedroom level has views over the top. The living level is more internalized. Uh, this, these are off you see of the, well, they look across the street at the, at the school. Um, but there is quite a bit of grade change. Um, we are studying the, acoust the acoustics on the project um, for the rooftop decks. Each rooftop deck is served by an individual stair from each unit. Um, these units are the lowest, these are next highest, and these are the highest. And Charles Salter and Associates, who provided preliminary review to DRC, is actually doing a three-dimensional um, study of the acoustics out there. We're using uh, the acoustics, 
acoustic report numbers that freely used, which was at the height of the traffic, not pandemic level traffic. So um, we're expected that the traffic levels and BART levels will come back to that level. So we're not basing it on COVID numbers. Um, we expect to have that report this week. Um, preliminarily, we believe the results will be similar to the exposed decks that Freely had, where it's a plexiglass solution. As there's four foot parapets around these and these stairwells all pop up eight feet, um, some of the units will shield other units. And so the units most in question are the ones on these edges. We don't expect sound walls. We don't expect eight foot tall parapets. We don't expect substantial impact. Um, we did build the 3D model to show uh, this is the backside of the westernmost units. They do step and we are doing green wall. We have uh, created the planters large enough to get the star jasmine to espalier up the wall. We are um, looking at uh, metal structure so we don't have wood decay over time. We don't have maintenance issues. Um, this is the upper level. Um, you can see that the window fenestration sort of speaks to the room behind it so that we don't have big, big windows arbitrarily looking at big, big windows. Um, the distance between these two is up almost 20, 20 to 27 feet, depending on which floor you're on. Um, I, I understand the subjective comment of design review. Um, we purposely did it this way to respect the privacy of the individuals inside. Um, last but not least, I, I think it's, I mean, I'd like to compliment a planner that used to work at, at the city of Lafayette, Payal, worked long and hard with me to analyze this edge to create um, a, an ADA compliant sidewalk, which is four feet wide, a landscape strip of substantial size that could contain a tree planting. And then we have these screen art panels that we want to place in there um, so that as you walk down this or as you drive to the school or you come to visit, you know, there's some little bit of art on the street. There's some pedestrian um, buffer between the pedestrian and the cars. Not that it's heavily trafficked because it's a dead end street, but um, when you do sidewalks, you know, conventionally people just pave to the edge and create a six or eight foot wide thing. And with the pedestrian traffic on a dead end street, four foot is code compliant and in my opinion, perfectly accept acceptable. Again, you can see in this diagram here in the upper right corner, I mean, this is the five foot setback line. The 10 foot would be double that, but the building is asked, you know, the, the pinch points are the dimensions in the, um, in the waiver request. Um, it's not a straight line. Um, and again, um, design review over time um, and staff got a nicely articulated set of vertical row houses with a variety of bay windows. Um, one of the important things to the design review commission and pre-application discussions was to get a, a a space on the ground floor that could be a home office type space that would activate this corner, get a tower element. You can't actually see this from Mount Diablo, but if you get far enough before you, you start to make that break right, right after the office building, this tower is visible and it does anchor this corner and provide sort of the lantern. Um, and that's kind of all I got. And I'm happy to answer questions and address any of the issues that uh, the three commissioners or staff brought up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Uh, do we have any questions for Mr. Fry? Um, it would appear, yeah, oh, there we go. Uh, Commissioner Maggio. Yes, thank you very much. Um, First question, or just a comment really, we did a lot of traffic studies at the Presidio when we were building the hotel and we measured the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge, Doyle Drive. And I just wanna say that when we studied the traffic levels during peak traffic, we found that the decibel level was lower than other times of the day because the cars were slower or bumper to bumper stopped. So what we, we find is the traffic um, decibel level is the highest 
uh, before you get to the peak period. So it might be interesting for you to take readings both on and off peak to really get a true so, reading of what's going on on the freeway. So the, the decibel readings that we're taking for the freely property, the ones we're leveraging, they're done over a 24 hour period. Oh, okay, great. Spike, so so you're, the, got, you're getting the whole range. And the spike is what you designed to. Okay, fantastic. Um, how many trees are you planning to replant? You know, I see, I see some tree shadows in your renderings, but do you have a list of how many trees you're going to be replanting in the uh, landscape? So at the moment, we're talking with Jonathan, your peer review architect and yes. our landscape architect, and I'm doing math and reading your code. And um, we believe... Jonathan, so I worked on this spreadsheet. I was up till one last night too. Um, we believe we're removing 15 protected trees. Mm -hmm. And a protected tree in this jurisdiction is basically anything that's over six inches, doesn't matter what it is. There's 21 trees cataloged on the site. Um, the the um, six that we're not removing are dead. I mean, so we'll be removing them, but you don't have to mitigate dead trees. Um, you're supposed to mitigate at a rate of two 15 gallons for every six inches you remove. And we're evaluating that. Um, we will be planting 20, the equivalent of 28 15 gallon trees, two of, okay. two of which are 24 inch box. Okay. Um, the species of the tree has been brought into question by your peer review. Um, but I do know that from Lafayette Circle that you know, there's street tree requirements of Lafayette that aren't on your protective native list because you don't tend to use those as your street trees. Um, there is a planting list contained in the application. We expect that the 28 15 gallon box trees will be planted. Now granted, it's actually 26, uh, 20, what, two less, 24 actual trees because two of them are box trees, they count for two. Okay. Um, so we would look to staff and or an advisor from planning commission to review the planting list. Okay. Obviously a valley oak would be nice. A couple of natives would be nice. The street trees, you know, sometimes those are up for grabs. Sometimes an accent tree is up for grabs. Um, mm -hmm. So we yeah, would look the, to staff. The, the valley oaks are the grand dame of the oaks. Uh, yep. The, the labatas, they get very large. So you know, you're going to want to choose something that's a, appropriate for the size that you're planting it in. So perhaps yeah. that might not be your best choice, but something that provides screening uh, between the units for the neighbors so that they're looking uh, through the filtered trees rather than directly into windows, I think would be extremely helpful. Uh, but I'll pay more attention to that planting list. Thank you. Mr. Radnich. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fry, for your presentation. I do have two questions. One is regarding trash collection and one is regarding the diesel emissions off the freeway. So the first for the trash collection, the public works comment was primarily focused on Stewart Stream. So then can you just walk us through how units six through 12 will get their trash collected? So um, a turning diagram for this, for fire truck back up and turn around at the end of Stewart Street was provided. It was provided with outside turning radius lines. Um, staff has requested that we show wheel lines within the outside turning. So uh, that exhibit will be updated. Um, when I initially spoke to the fire department, they, we, they talked about pulling into these and then thought better of that later and want them, they're gonna park on the street. Uh, the private driveway. I've been, I've had conversations with Kim, Kimberly Lamb at uh, Republic, uh, same lady that provided us advice on Lafayette Circle. And currently they come down the street and go up to the top and service the houses that are up here or free these project that will be up here. They turn around and they come back down, which then puts the, the grabbers on this project side. We've talked about um, I go, how do you want to stage the trash? Because they have the ability that they'll go get it. They don't, it doesn't need to be like your house where it's parked at the curb and they go to the curb and flip it into the thing. 
she said, well, your driveway is big enough. You could stage them along here and they'll go in and get them and bring them to their truck and then pull down to here and then pull over to here and get these and then turn around and then leave. Wait, so. sorry, do you mind, do you mind um, just slowing down on that piece so that they will physically walk into the private driveways yeah, the, and pull the carts down? They have, uh, they have that service where they will go in and get them so they don't have to drive into these private driveways. Okay. Yeah, because my concern was that the trash cans would be placed on the drive, yes, right there, and then which would be in the walking um, pedestrian way for the people coming down from the development above. Okay, and then my other question, um, I'm, I understand the concept of CEQA in reverse. I definitely understand it's you're looking at the project on the environment, not the project, not the environment on the project. But I know there are some exceptions when it comes to the back mid thresholds for diesel emissions off the freeway. So I know in the exemption memo, it's discussed that the project will adhere to policies and codes, but specifically policies from the general plan. So I was wondering if you can walk through what was done to look at diesel emissions off the freeway onto the project. So for example, like are they doing MERV 13 filters or anything like well, the that? California code requires that if you have a housing project or a school within forget how many feet it is. I try not to remember stuff like that, but I'm always wrong. Um, you have to utilize um, certain HVAC systems and filtering systems because you're within that distance and that's California state building code. So you, you, you're doing it whether you want to or not. So, I mean, technically, you know, all these units will have an HVAC system that filters the air to avoid particulates being brought in by the mechanical system. Um, people opening their windows, that's a personal choice. You, you, don't, you don't have to do anything for that. So that's how that's handled, having done units next to the freeway and okay. these train lines. Any other questions for Mr. Fry, Mr. Ising? Uh, thanks, um, Mr. Fry. Um, just getting back to the um, the pedestrian connectivity. So, just so I'm I'm understanding, the the project will be striping a sidewalk on the private street connecting okay. to the Easterly project. So, the Easterly project. Um, if you review their drawings, they actually put a sidewalk here. Okay. And there's no guarantee that East, and if the Easterly project shows up and does that, because the this property is their property, that's not our property. So we that's can't. part of their flag. Yeah, that's what I was asking Jonathan earlier. So yeah, so our, that our, south side of the street is on their flagpole. Correct. And they have a 10 foot access easement over our lane. So both parties can drive up this and drive down this, but we can't build over here. So as this is a private driveway, we spoke with Public Works and said, if, the, if they never build anything, um, we'll, we'll stripe this so that it gives the appearance of a narrower drive lane, but it signals to people that you should walk there. It's like doing a bike lane, but for people. Right. Right. Um, and that seemed an acceptable solution on a private driveway to Public Works. So the, the sidewalk improvements on the south side are gonna be done by the adjacent project not, or are they part of your project improvements? This, we can't build on another person's property. So that would be there. Okay. Why is it shown on the plans, sheet C1 then? I'm, so that's adding to my confusion. On the vesting tenant amount by a human company? That, yeah, that. Uh, that's, that's a curb. Curb and gutter. Yeah. So, but you just said you can't, this project can't build any improvements on that side. We can't build the sidewalk to my knowledge. We okay. Would have, we would, and either, even to do this, we would have to get three of these approvals. Okay. And you are... And you're putting handicap ramps on the curb returns? 
Yes, where you've instructed the civil engineer to update both these locations. Okay. And then um, one of the comments from engineering was to contribute um, monies in the amount of 10K towards a, a protected crosswalk on Mount Diablo. Is that happening or? To my knowledge, Jonathan would have to speak whether Stuart has accepted or rejected that. I haven't heard anything. We've accepted oh. that. Okay. Um, and then the, um, it's, so the, the acoustic study that Salter is doing that'll be ready next week. If, um, if we don't have another meeting with you, how, how is that gonna get handled with staff? I, I assume you'll just work it out with staff, but so part what of what, we, what DRC we... was asking was to be able to see what that looked like and see exhibits. Yeah, so the report's due to me this week and Charlie and I are pretty sure of what it's gonna be, but I'm, I'm not gonna promise something that might not show up. And I will add a drawing and an exhibit and provide it to staff along with the report and the findings. And you will see that. And if it's deemed acceptable, I'm sure staff will route it to the chair going, you know, saying that this is what we believe it is. At the DRC hearing, we said it is more than likely going to be a four foot tall plexiglass windscreen type element. And uh, Jonathan will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those are considered aperturances. So they don't count against height or anything like that. Um, and, and we'll make sure that Jonathan has his exhibits and he has his report and that'll come before you. And um, I'm, I'm sure it'll get routed to DRC because if I was the chair, I would want to see what the solution was. Right, right. Okay. And then my last uh, question is regarding the the east um, east side, the request for um, renderings for the east elevation. So I, I tend to do 3D rather than flat elevations. Um, I can certainly provide flat elevations, but the flat elevations kind of don't speak to the, the jumps and planes, um, which is why I like to provide the angled views because I'm, I'm, I'm not, sometimes it's difficult to visualize in three dimension, two dimensional things. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciated that when you went through that. Um, I'm curious about the, uh, the east building though. What's, um, and I'm not, this completely rem yeah but the east side of that building so um um actually, for the adjacent um for the adjacent project so the what adjacent they'll be looking project at has an eight foot tall sound wall that runs down this property line and comes around this corner so they won't see that that east well, side of that building but, yeah what's interesting about the site is their property is up here which is almost there so they'll see a piece of the top floor and some of the parapet and little stairs popping up. We, I have a rendering, I, I have a view of that. I'll provide that to staff so it can get into your packet. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. That was all I had. Thank you. Um, so a lot of that questions that I had got covered. Just one final one from me, Mr. Fry. So you mentioned that your consultant was working with the fire district on the aerial access. Is that going to be a report? When is that going to be done, et cetera? Uh, it'll be done before we're back in front of you and it'll be in staff's hands before we're back in front of you. The report has been written. The fire consultant is um, David Hoover and Associates. The record architect liaison that we're using is LCA Architects out of Walnut Creek, Carl Campos and David Bogstad, who both have um, talked to them um, about this preliminarily. So um, what we expect to have happen is we expect a memo to come in from the fire department um, being a little less strident about the buildability of the product because the, the real issue is that they have their response time for an aerial ladder truck exceeds their rules. 
So they ask, what provisions can you make to this building that allows us to get that response time? The other thing that, um, I mean, I was a little bit surprised that letter showed up because two years ago, I met with Captain Duter and went over this in detail with her and then it gets reviewed. And so because this is above 30 feet, they want an aerial access truck to this because they won't take their ladder up 30 feet. But oddly enough, on the backside of each building, it's less than 30 feet. So they could ladder up from the backsides in an emergency before the truck can get there. But we are going to be proposing some additional safety measures to um, provide them a little more comfort while their truck's in route. And that letter's been written and formally submitted uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Um, any other questions from Mr. Fry? I'd like to address one of um, Commissioner Maggio's comments about consistent setbacks. Because I always find that interesting in these housing projects. We actually, you know, I followed along on the Lennox one. I followed along on the Huff Avenue one. I followed along on the Brown Avenue one. I followed along on the Sotheby's Mount Diablo one. And inclusionary housing projects push the setbacks to provide the inclusionary housing. And almost every single one of those chases around five feet or less. And so we, we tried to stay pol as polite as we could along Stewart Street, providing the 40% lands landscape and the art panels and that. And then on the freeway side and the street side got a little more aggressive. But if you do look at the site plan, the only one that truly is five, uh, five feet all the way is this one. Mm -hmm. This one varies. This jumps back, this jumps out, this jumps back. So there is articulation on the two public sides and even with the neighbor behind. I wasn't very polite to Caltrans, but it is a rather steep hill going up. Um, so we think we've done a, a, a nice job citing the building. I know there was concern at design review level that a majority of the site is building, but if you actually do the math on the site, two thirds of the site isn't building. It's open to the sky and dealing with C3 and, um, so, yeah, um, but I, I wanted, that was an astute comment of yours. So I wanted to play through kind of how we got where we got. Well, thank, thank you very much for uh, picking that up because yeah, that certainly was a concern of mine, but I see that you do have quite a bit of articulation on Stewart Street. It's not a flat line. And I was looking at the drawings versus being on site examining the poles. Uh, and this is this is very helpful. What I did just pick up from the landscape plan, though, is that uh, rather than 24 or more trees, you're down to 23. And uh, the trees on some of your uh, 3D elevations don't really exist on the landscape plan. Um, some of the, the drawings that are 3D, I see a tree here, I see the agrifolia there. Uh, but mostly what you have on the front are a few um, maples that are deciduous. So a large part of the season, you really don't have any tree cover. You have branches. And then in between the buildings, it's really um, the trailing plants and not a lot of tree screening at all. Um, so I'm, I'm just concerned about the amount of vegetation really more than I am the actual setback. Um, like I said, we're, we're the, the team's open to species. So if non-deciduous trees are appropriate in these locations, um, that's, I'm sure the team will be more than happy to revise it. The, 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 the deciduous against the second floor, which is a living room, you know, looking through deciduous trees in the winter is nice. You're also a floor up. So um, you, it's not like the people standing at grade are looking straight into your room. You're 12 feet in the air, plus the height of the, the um, sill. So, you know, the deciduous trees may be appropriate there, but if we wanted to switch species uh, to evergreen, that's fine.
Uh, Vice Radnich. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, one of the other comments that or concerns that were raised by DRC was the lack of community space. So, Mr. Fry, I was wondering if you could just kind of walk us through what um, options did your team consider for uh, providing or increasing community space um, that were obviously rejected? Well, you're, you're chasing multiple things on a project like this. You're chasing unit count. You're chasing uh, livability and saleability of the unit. And there's a maximum amount of buildable area for every project. Um, early on in the DRC, um, we actually, I'll go to the floor plan. So this space right here on the corner mm -hmm. originally didn't exist. So there, this was landscape. And through the DRC and design process, they felt it was more important to have this. So that would have been, you know, like on Brown Avenue at the corner of Brown and Mount Diablo, which is a kind of an important corner, having a little plaza with a sculpture was appropriate because that's, you know, it's a completely different intersection. This is an intersection of Stewart Street, which is dead ending in a private driveway that goes up the hill. So community plaza they felt it was more important to bring the building to the ground and activate it with building rather than activate it with space. Um, so we developed it this way. Um, we did move the mailbox out here and have a little place to sit, maybe get picked up by Uber to try and create, you know, a little bit of this in front of that, which um, is kind of what you know, this is about to try and create that tower element that comes to the ground. And then there was the discussion about open space and decks. And personally, I'm a huge fan of having uh, the Juliet balcony where the doors open. So the room becomes your deck rather than have a deck go out there that gets put up with barbecues and bicycles and things like that. So then design review um, through our collaboration said, can you do roof decks? And so now you end up with these large roof decks. And I've designed a couple projects in San Francisco where you know, these guys and these guys start to form communities. So these are like your backyard fences between them. And so the community occurs between units and neighbors on the top floor. It doesn't occur at grade with the public. I have a project in Barcadero Lofts that's like this. I have one at 200 Brandon that's like this. Um, and, and of course, there's not a weight room somewhere for everybody to come to, but a 12 unit project can't support stuff like that. So we did it a different way. And so, okay, thank you. And so this plan set that you're showing now, this is the same plan set that was reviewed on March 10th by design review when they provided those comments after seeing this plan set? Yes. So nothing has changed since they made that comment between December, sorry, between March 10th and then tonight. Oh, excuse me. So sorry. between March 10th and tonight, there haven't been any changes to the community space for their comment? No. Okay, thank you. Do you have any further questions for Mr. Fry? Okay, uh, we will close that off. Um, Greg, do we have any public comments? If you would like to make a public comment on this item, please go ahead and use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. We have no callers, so star nine is not an option. Seeing none. Okay, well, uh, normally we throw it back for some rebuttal time, Mr. Fry, but uh, Really nothing to rebut, so I'll leave it open to see if you want to make any closing comments. Um, I actually have a question for staff. DRC um, making a comment like a building needs a community space. How, how is that, um, having sat on DRC, requiring a program that isn't required as part of their purview, how does a comment like that come forward? I mean, is there, because I couldn't find anything in the, general plan or any of that to, that would have caused me to design that originally. Um, open space and community space is, a specific amount is not required in any of our documents. So looking at the zoning code, looking at objective standards, looking at um, 
the general plan, um, downtown design guidelines, but the downtown design guidelines do broadly state that in all districts, community space should be provided. So how is community um, space defined? I'm sorry? How is that defined? I mean, is it up to the designer and the team in the process or is it a physical room? It gives examples of community space in the downtown design guidelines, um, including I think water features is one of them. And I'd be happy to look at that document for some more examples. So could my request goes to then as we work on the acoustics and work on the fire, can we review that document with you, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Maggio. Sorry. Sorry, I forgot to ask about the guest parking. I know there was a concession requested on the guest parking. I see it drawn in two locations on the current plan. So is is it is that parking guest parking staying and the waiver was for additional parking to be street parking i i'm sorry mr clay could i or mr fry could i have some clarification on the guest parking so we're required by unit count to provide two guest parking spaces in order to place them on the site we are placing them in the setback in the 10 foot setback and you're not allowed to put parking in your setback Mm -hmm. And so the waiver we're requesting is if we would like to provide the guest parking um, and the waiver to put it in the setback. Okay, great. That, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fry, any other closing comments? No, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I'll bring the matter back uh, to the commission. And I'll open the floor for any comments. Uh, Commissioner Heising. Um, yeah, I'll start off. I, I the major concerns that I had were around the uh, fire department access, and um, also on a more personal note, that was that was from a safety standpoint. So uh, that was at the top of my list. And then uh, I, I was satisfied to hear um, the fire department is just wanting to pull onto the private drive and, or the private street and not go into the driveways because there's clearly not enough width there to, for the trucks to get in there and put their outriggers out. And that's, that's the reason for their, their minimum spacing requirement. But if, I would presume it's because they can jump from roof to roof of the units and they can get all the way to the north property line on top of the roof. So that's why they're willing to uh, just extend the ladder off the private street. And then uh, my, other, um, uh, my other concerns were addressed regarding pedestrian access. It looks like um, proper access uh, may occur in the future when the project to the east goes in. Um, I like the discussion about the sidewalk. I agree with uh, Mr. Fry. I, I, don't, I, I don't see a need to have a big grandiose sidewalk since this street dead ends at the Caltrans right away. So, um, you know, plus a, a sidewalk with wider than four feet, which is the minimum would be competing with the landscaping, which is already on the, on the, on the shy side. So um, I, was ha I was happy to hear that conversation. Uh, the, as far as the building um, aesthetics go, I think it's a nice looking, I think it's a nice looking project. I like the additions made um, later on. Um, when I did read the uh, DRC comments, uh, meeting minutes, I, I saw that there were changes made, the same ones that Mr. Fry articulated. Um, and and um, I think I think the project looks nice. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Any other comments? I have one. Um, yeah, 
<laughs> I appreciate the um, applicants' um, presentation and answering questions. I feel everything I kind of had concerns about uh, were addressed. I do think um, the diesel emissions off the freeway are something worth noting. And I do understand that there's building codes and I do understand that, you know, there's different HVAC requirements. Um, so I will trust that uh, the city will be receiving whatever they need in order to ensure that the appropriate MERV 13 or whatever, you know, filtration systems are included. Um, I, the one thing that I feel slightly uncomfortable about is design review commission's comment about the community space. Um, but the design review commission also uh, requested kind of that corner unit or, you know, kind of be bumped out to create more of a tower. And I do think that's a better addition than having a slightly larger corner park right there. But I would just um, say if there, it does sound like it, Mr. Fry ex, um, expressed that if there is something that he can maybe do to work with the city to just kind of try to address DRC's comments a little more on that. Um, and have one other thing, but I lost my train of thought. So, oh, this is what it was. Um, on the south elevations and the east elevation, I know it's pricey, and so I don't want to, you know, dictate or mandate, right, that the applicant do more, but I really like the screens that are being, um, the artistic screens that are being proposed on Stewart Stream. So if there's anything like that, that can be kind of incorporated a little bit on the east elevation, or sorry, the very, very east of the entire project site elevation or on the south um, elevation that's similar in the screens. I think that would be nice, but um, that's a DRC type item. So within Planning Commission, um, I appreciate the conversation tonight and I can make the findings. Thank you. Commissioner Maggio. You're on mute, just so you know. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, you know, I I like the added corner element. I, I think it provides a there there and I think a bench and thinking about what the, the future owners are going to need there. People do wait for Ubers, um, uh, the sidewalk. And I like the articulation on the front, which gives it more depth than a straight line would have. So. Um, I, I think that's good. Uh, the natural screening on the freeway side, I think is enough. I'm not concerned about, about the distance uh, between the development and the freeway. Um, I'm, my only remaining concern on this project, I, and I actually think the roof, roof decks will be used. So, I mean, a lot of people address community space in a lot of ways. For some people, it's just extra gathering space outside. Uh, and with this particular uh, project, we don't have a lot of outside gathering space other than on the roofs, but they're private condo units and Lafayette has a lot of parks and trails and, and it is walking distance to downtown. So there, you're not isolated in, in these buildings. And I think that kind of works. My one remaining concern is the landscape plan. And particularly during the winter, looking at the, the palette of plants and trees, um, the winter months are gonna be pretty stark. Um, some of the perennials you, you cut way down. Um, so I, I think we might wanna revisit the landscape plan and see if we can make it a little bit more lush year round so that it is not so Spartan in the winter. Thank you. Um, so uh, my two concerns were fire access, which looks to be addressed and we're gonna get the report before we come forward, but it sounds like it's addressed. And the sound acoustics, cause you're that close to highway 24, but it seems to be that's also gonna be covered. So again, I, I, I'm okay with that. 
Um, I would love more open space, community space, but I just think because of the location, um, I, I think they've done what they can do there. So I don't, sometimes we can't force something based on the space that there is. And quite frankly, these are purchased units. So I don't really know if the purchaser wants that community space beyond maybe the deck. Um, and it's not that far to go, as Commissioner Maggio said, to hit some community space in Lafayette. So again, I think they're working with what they had there. Um, I like the, the appearance of the project. I think they've done a really good job working with DRC to get to where they are. Um, I can make the findings. I do have a question for staff, um, for Jonathan and for Greg. So what I'm trying to understand here is the recommendation is to continue this to the next meeting. Um, and there's going to be a resolution there, but we're still awaiting things coming from the applicant as Commissioner Heising pointed out. So you're going to get those things, incorporate them into the resolution and all we're going to do is approve them. We're not gonna have another meeting again, or are we? That's, I'm just trying to get the process right because that's gonna be meeting number four if we are going to discuss it. So I just wanna make sure we leave enough room if it's necessary beyond us. Yes, the, the recommendation was to continue the public hearing, um, bring forth the resolution and give an opportunity for the commission to discuss uh, fire, the fire letter and the acoustic letter. Um, but if those things are satisfied by the end of the meeting to adopt a resolution. Okay, um, and then that would leave essentially one meeting left over. Um, and it, one would hope since there's, I mean, there was really one letter of technically of opposition, that's likely not gonna happen, but I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page on process. Right. Um, so it looks like we've closed our discussions, fair. Um, so I'm gonna look at Vice Chair Radnich because she's our expert in this. You, would you like to make a uh, motion? Um, okay, give me a second here. <laughs> I move, um, so regarding TR9539, DR23-19, and TP50-19, I move that we continue the item to June 21st, 2021, to allow staff to prepare a resolution approving the project, subject to conditions and to items discussed tonight. Do I have a second? Second. You have a second. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, do the roll call here. Um, Commissioner Ising. Aye. Commissioner Maggio. Aye. Vice Chair Radnich. Aye. Commissioner Farzan. Aye. So we have a four zero vote. And remind me again, how many days to appeal? Not okay. here, right? Because it's a continuation, correct? Right. Just want to be clear. Okay. 14 days after June, June for 21st. Right. right. After. Thank you. Um, we are going to move to other business. So do we have a volunteer for ARC for June 18th? I'm looking at my calendar. I, I missed the last one who volunteered and Jonathan was really great and gave me my own um, private follow-up meeting. I can do the 18th if um, nobody else is free and I will put it on my calendar right now, Jonathan. I, I, can, I can do it. I haven't done it for a while. Um, go for it. I'll do the next one. Okay. Mr. Heising, it is. All right. All right, uh, do we have any commissioner's reports? I can just share for GPAC, um, there's actually not an update since our last uh, planning commission meeting, but um, it seems like interest in GPAC is continuing. It seems like um, the city is still working hard, staff is still working hard on it. So just kind of that reminder note to let your networks know, let your community members know, um, encourage use of um, planlafayette.org website 
and there's a lot of interactive tools um, on the website to solicit feedback. Another thing I might just add to is um, let your community know to sign up for the Lafayette emails. Um, what is it? The almost daily update and the weekly roundup email or something. I read it in last week's, right? There's a shout out to GPAC. So um, that's just another great way to receive information. But we have a GPAC meeting next Tuesday, the 15th. So at our next PC, I'll be able to give you an update. Great, thank you. And I, I mean, I would reiterate basically when I get the information from the city, I then forward it to people that I know. And then I know it's also posted on several different pages on Facebook, et cetera. So it, it's getting covered that way. And I think the interest is now starting to pick up because it's moving forward because now I'm getting uh, emails personally from all sides of, of the equation outside of uh, being on the planning uh, commission. So it, it is it is starting to pick up. The interest, is, I think, is getting greater uh, as we move forward. Um, do we have any other commissioner's reports? All right. Planning director's report, if any. Uh, two brief items. One, uh, ABAG on April 25th issued, formally issued the uh, regional housing needs allocation to all Bay Area jurisdictions. Uh, and it confirmed the preliminary numbers that, that Lafayette had received post December. The initial was 1661, uh, a December revised based on Plain Bay Area uh, revisions. Um, Change that number to 2114. So that is uh, currently Lafayette's draft allocation. Um, this started the appeal period during, and we have until July 9 uh, to file a formal appeal. There are some very narrow criteria under which an appeal can be filed. Uh, the council will discuss whether or not to appeal um, on the 14th of June and the 28th, just two quick agenda items. And um, so we're, we'll see on that. And then um, a long standing uh, planning commissioner, Gina Telovich, um, there was a ceremony at the community center uh, today to place a plaque. Um, so when you visit very adjacent to the, the Bocce court, you can now see the plaque uh, honoring Gina Telvich and her, her tremendous service to the community and served more than a quarter century on, the, on this planning commission. Wow. So I would ask uh, that we adjourn in her memory tonight. If that pleases the chair. All right, thank you very much. And with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of the week. <laughs>